Hey, how's it going everyone? I'm Klidge, and today I still want to try something different. So, for anyone who watches my streams or knows me personally, knows that I have a deep-seated love for history. So much so that it is one of the areas that I can teach at my real job. This love of history is part of the reason I am so invested in the Fate lore, despite the many gross over-exaggerations of some historical figures. However, I am able to recognize that it is done in good fun, so I don't really get too hung up on that. Fate has introduced me to a number of various historical figures that I didn't know existed or that I knew very little about. For example, Lakshmi Bai, and much of the Indian pantheon was introduced to me through this series. And ever since, I've wanted to know more about the characters that they are based on. Now, as someone born and raised in small town America, my knowledge of Japanese historical figures was limited to an issue of a magazine that talked about how women would dye their teeth black in the three great unifiers, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now, Fate players should recognize most, if not all, of these names if they have A, ever played a Guda Guda event, or B, played the Kama event. Fate players know Nobu as the comedic narcissist with a winning smile and a penchant for setting nonsense. She is also the buddy of Okita Soji, who is a goofy, tuberculosis-ridden Shinsengumi who only ever wanted a swimsuit. Unfortunately, Okita is not the main character of this video. Instead, I wanted to look at one of her co-workers in a recent addition to the Guda Guda lineup, a Mr. Saito Hajime. Okay, I lied. I believe that what I need to cover first and foremost for all of you is what the Shinsen Gumi was. In a word, they were police. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. So rather than working backwards, let's start from the beginning. Commodore Perry is an infamous figure in history, as his arrival on Japanese shores meant the forced opening of Japan to the rest of the world in the year 1853. It's a long story as to why Japan had closed its borders, and one I'm sure I'll share at another time, but with the opening of the country, the people were divided on what they believed should be done. This put the people of Japan into a few groups. Loyalists, who remained loyal to the Tokugawa shogunate, and imperialists, known as Sono Joi, who were in support of the emperor, Meiji, hence the Meiji Restoration. In 1862, the Tokugawa shogunate formed a regime of 234 ronin, who are masterless samurai, to march on Kyoto. This was done in response to the rising tensions and violence that was occurring in Kyoto. And the primary role of this group, known as the Roshigumi, was to protect the Shogun. However, one of the leaders of the Roshigumi, Kiyokawa Hachiro, was actually in support of the Sono Joi, and upon arriving in Kyoto, declared the Roshigumi whose true intentions were to protect the imperialists in Kyoto. This announcement caused a ripple in the group, and 13 members defected. These 13 decided to remain in Kyoto as its protectors, still loyal to the shogunate and would later become the foundation for the Shinsengumi. The initial plan of guarding the shogunate in Kyoto eventually evolved into a much more broad idea, that being the restoration of Kyoto in the name of the shogun. Thus, the group took to patrolling the streets and renamed themselves the Shinsengumi. They were officially granted police status for Kyoto by the Aizu clan who were also supporters of the shogunate. They were initially led by a guy called Serizawa Kamo, but due in large part to his own erratic actions and behaviors, a plot was formed to assassinate him and his subordinates, led by Hijikata. From there, the leadership role switched to a man by the name of Kondo Isami, who I believe we will eventually get as a fate servant. Under Kondo, we now have the true Shinsengumi. So, the role of the Shinsengumi was pretty simple. They were a police force focused on maintaining the shogunate in Japan, but mostly out of Mibu, which is a suburb of Kyoto at the time. The group was quickly given the name The Wolves of Mibu, which, though it may sound cool, was not a flattering title. The title came from the swiftness in which the group would take down potential threats, but likened the group to savage animals meant to be feared. This is who the Shinsengumi were. But let's talk specifics. The character that inspired me to make this video is not our lovable Okita or the pickle-loving Hijikata, but rather the wild-haired business suit-wearing Virgil impersonator Saito Hajime. And there's a reason for this. While I have a great affection for Okita, Hajime jumped out at me while I was researching Bonsi's for another video. The description of his Bonsi is truly sad, but it highlights something important that only he did out of the Kaldan Shinsengumi members. Hajime survived. The Bonsi Eve reflects the thoughts of Hajime in later years, pondering if all of his comrades in arms from the Shinsengumi found what it was they wanted in the end. He is also the sole carrier of the memories of his comrades. So with that, let's take a closer look at Hajime-chan, as he calls himself. Saito Hajime was born in the Musashi province of Edo, which is now Tokyo, under the name Yamaguchi Hajime. Unfortunately, 
we do not know much about his early life. We know that he had two older siblings, one brother and one sister, and that he fled Edo in 1862 after killing a Hatamoto, a high-ranking samurai of the Shogun, on accident. Now, everywhere that I looked, they say that he killed the Hatamoto by accident, but never how that happened. What we do know is that he was one of the members of the Roshigumi who dissented and helped found the Shinsengumi. Fun historical fact! Him, Okita, and a third member named Toto Heisuke were all the same age of 19 years old at the founding of the Shinsengumi, and they were all the youngest members of the Kondo group. So, while you're staying awake all night trying to write an exam at 19, remember that! Anyway, at the formation of the Shinsengumi, Hajime's prowess with the sword landed him the all-important possession of Captain of the Third Unit. Along with this title, he also received another job, discovering spies in their ranks. Now, Hajime, despite his young age, was incredibly dignified. He carried himself well and was described as a man not predisposed to small talk, and as someone who never dragged his feet when he walked. He also always sat in the formal position known as Seiza, which looks like this. Supposedly, he was constantly on alert and monitoring what anybody said. All of this combined made him somewhat of a mystery to the others in his ranks, like a lone ranger who joined up with a posse. For the sake of time, I'm going to skim through most of the major altercations that the Shinsengumi were a part of, however, I will try to make it make sense. Historical battles are never easy to explain. Let's start with the Ikedaya incident. This occurred because the Shinsengumi arrested a man by the name of Furutaka Shuntaro for being a member of an anti-shogunate group and was plotting to use the Mori clan to help overthrow the shogunate. This, along with a plan to burn down Kyoto and capture the daimyo of Aizo, was found out by Hijikata doing horrendous torture to the poor guy. Something about him knocking him out and drilling holes in his legs and putting lit candles into the holes. This led to a conflict at the Ikedaya Inn where a group of Sono Joy were holding base. The Shinsengumi were divided into two groups, one led by Hijikata and another by Kondo. Hijikata's group was eventually split into two, that's not as important. The incident initially started as an investigation and then devolved into a full-on fight. By the conclusion of it all, half of the Sono Joy had escaped and the other half had met their ends at the hands of the Shinsengumi, or through suicide. The incident began at 7pm and once they knew that half of their quarry had escaped, they hunted the entire night like a pack of wolves, arresting 23 and killing 8 more. Also on this night, the homo Sakamoto Ryoma was attacked, though he himself was not injured. Yet, he would later be assassinated in 1867, but that will come up later. As for casualties on the Shinsengumi side, only one person was killed in combat and another succumbed to their wounds later. Heisuke and the second captain Nakagura Shinpachi, who were also likely to get into FGO, were injured and Okita coughed up blood for the very first time from tuberculosis. To the allies of the Shogun, this was viewed as an outstanding success. Next is a bit briefer and is known as the Kinmon Incident. This was initiated by the Choshu rebels who were imperialists. The Choshu suffered heavy casualties and it is believed that once they realized that they were going to lose, they set fire to Kyoto. As for the Shinsengumi's involvement in casualties, my research turned up that they were present and that is it. What we do know, however, is that Hajime was given an award by the Shogun for his endeavors during the Kinmon Incident. Finally, and most importantly, is the Boshin War. This was the most major altercation that the Shinsengumi were a part of, and would be the one where the group inevitably met their end. I'm not going to go into great detail about what happened here, but here are the basics. The war was caused by the growing tensions between the Imperialists and the Loyalists, Emperor vs. Shogun, and growing dissatisfaction with the Shogunate's rule. Throw in a bit of Western influence and trade into the mix, and we have a recipe for a good old-fashioned war on our hands. The Shinsengumi's involvement was clearly on the side of the Shogun, but this was not the strong side of the fight. The Shogunate was in a very clear decline during this time, and the Shogun, along with the Shinsengumi, left Kyoto peacefully. From here, they would become a part of another group known as the Koyo Chinbutai. This new group was less than successful in their fights against the Imperials, and eventually Shinpachi and some of the other members left the corpse altogether. This was a huge deal to the former Shinsengumi, as one of the five tenets of the corpse was that you were not permitted to leave once you joined as doing so would be dishonoring the Shogun. After jumping from temporary base to temporary base, Kondo was eventually captured and executed for being a member of the plot that assassinated Sakamoto Ryoma. Soon after, the Koyo joined the Republic of Ezo, an opposition force to the Imperialists. During this time as well, Hijikata was shot but survived at the Battle of Utsunomiya Castle, and holding up the ranks of the former Shinsengumi was Hajime, leading the others into battle in Aizu territory. He fought valiantly until the end of the battle, but he and his group were captured and taken in as prisoners of war. 
Thus, the Battle of Aizu was concluded. Hijikata would later recover from his injuries and led a fairly successful campaign until he was killed by a bullet in June of 1869, and soon after the Republic of Ezo surrendered and the Boshin War finished. Of the prominent members of the Shinsengumi, Saito Hajime and Nakagura Shinpachi survived. Okita died of tuberculosis in Edo in 1868, for those curious. But now that the war was over, what does a manslayer do? Saito Hajime had a knack for changing his name, and in this situation, he did just that. He went by the name of Fujita Goro and moved to the Aizu territory and eventually joined the police force. He eventually met a woman named Takagi Tokyo and they married and had three children. He still has descendants to this day, which is amazing. For his work as a police officer, he now fought on the side that he had resisted for so long, the Meiji government. He assisted in quelling some rebellions and riots, but for the most part lived out the rest of his life in a quiet, normal environment. He was not vocal about his experience in the Shinsengumi, and only shared that information with a select few. However, he was the only police officer permitted to carry a katana, which may seem strange, but think about it like this. Only samurai were permitted to carry katana around openly, in doing so showed an allegiance to the shogun or a daimyo. So, to have someone do so after the shogunate's fall almost feels like a bit of resistance to the change. Alternatively, this is his way of remembering his former comrades who he fought alongside, but the truth is lost to history. He did, however, with the surviving members of the Shinsengumi, construct a monument in Tokyo known as the Grave of the Shinsengumi, in honor of their fallen friends. He would retire from the police force eventually and take on jobs as a guard at the Tokyo Museum and a clerk for a school. Eventually he would die, sitting Seiza, at the age of 71 in 1915. It's hard to imagine what sort of a life a person like Saito Hajime lived after the war. His comrades were gone, mostly, and he had fought on the losing side. But he still took up the mantle of protector, even if it was for the people he had resisted. To me, this is what makes the lines of his bonsi so emotional. Realistically, the way how he is depicted in FGO is incredibly off to how he acted historically, and a lot of that is the good goodification of the Meiji era that FGO loves to do. But the most historically accurate thing that hit perfectly comes from his Bon CE. It's simply called Memoir, and reads as follows. Even though it was quiet, the man's final years were unaffected and sincere, with fortitude and vigor. He quit the corpse, stayed in Aizu, changed his name, and worked for the government as a police officer for his entire life until the very end. This respectable man did not talk much about the guys he used to fight together with. This man intentionally lived like a samurai in a period where the way of the samurai was faded and lost its value. Just kidding. Really, even though I look like this, I actually have a loose tongue and that's when I speak untactfully. I would talk incessantly and mix truths with fictions. Some time ago, too, at the dojo, my arrogantly poking at the youngsters who were stabbing their bamboo swords with all their might somehow became me talking down to them. In the first place, I can't think about each and every detail about things like killing with the sword like this or cutting things off like that. I'm so absorbed in it, I'm just crying out loud and brandishing it around, you know? Oh well, that's the way it was back then. Obsessively fighting, obsessively laughing and crying, obsessively dying away. Everyone was running around like that. That's why I thought at least someone like me could hold up the flag and live boldly until the very end. The lone Shinsengumi who continued to fight the turbulent Bakumatsu and lived through until the end. No one knows of his true thoughts. Hey, everyone, did you manage to find the end of your dreams? Thanks for sticking through to the end, guys. Uh, I would like to keep doing stuff like this. If you enjoyed it, please let me know. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that nonsense if you want. If you want a certain historical figure for me to do a deep dive into, just let me know in the comments. And I will catch you all next time. Until then, peace out.